You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for October 30th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Uh, coming to you live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we were going to do a letter show, and we will do a letter show, but oh boy, it's the professional left with Drift Class and Blue Gal. Oh, God. I just got all kinds of chills and free gifts and karmic retributions and oh my goodnesses and all dropped at my, my feet all this week. So And and thank you to everyone that has sent a box or a card or a letter or a care package or a flask. You know, I even got a box of yarn a couple of weeks ago and yeah. I'm very grateful for that. I mean, we've had just uh, the P.O. box has been... Uh, busier than usual and we're very grateful for that and thank you so much yep. we uh printed out 12 pages single spaced of letters and uh, if you wrote a usps letter to us we will be reading those uh from time to time in the coming weeks uh we had so many letters come in that i really just had to cut and paste this week and and something else is going on next Tuesday that kind of kept me busy this week at Crooks yeah. and Liars. I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, is it <laughs> is it the NBA Finals? No. This was this is it was the World Series. No, it's over. I think this letter show was a great idea, and it's a yeah. good time to do it. I don't. I regret nothing. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, uh, I do regret that we can't include everybody in the show. It just, time just ran out on us, and yeah. we're. Recording at three eleven p.m. on Friday. On Friday, uh, it is Drift Glass's birthday. I don't it know if he birthday. wants me to do sure. the Marilyn Monroe impersonation. Nah, in private, baby. In <laughs> Happy private. birthday! Yeah, I can do that in private. Yeah. That's no, a that, good that's, idea. That's that's this, that's the premium. <laughs> that's the premium paywall version <laughs> of the professional podcast. Yeah, there is no paywall no, no, no. ever. No, we don't do that. But uh, we are going to read some letters today. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, media fails. Well, um, and and some advice that we are following to stay yes. sane uh, over the next five days. Yes, we are, um, and probably beyond. First of all, stop reading the polls. Unless you're paid to do so, stop reading them. Stop obsessing over things, numbers, and turnout uh, totals and and uh, results that you cannot control. It'll just make you crazy. The ball is in the air now. And the only thing you can do to affect the trajectory is probably what you are already doing as good, diligent, democracy-loving liberals. Mm -hmm. You're phone banking for candidates. I'm spending my birthday weekend phone banking for candidates. Uh, my wife did an enormous number of um, postcards to voters, just spent a, a ton of time customizing each one, writing each one, making sure that it was the one that this person would pick out of the slush pile of uh, literature that arrives in everyone's mailbox this time of year. And spent a ton of time doing that. And, and is not doing that because, you know, it's the, the lag, the mail lag time means it won't do any good now. Right. I, I stopped doing them on uh, Tuesday afternoon. We took the last batch to the post office. Yeah. But I did a total in late September to now of 125 at about 10 minutes apiece. So yeah. it was a lot of work, but it yeah. was worth it. Yeah. And, and there's and there's an immense feeling of satisfaction that I got from driving them to the post office. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, make sure everyone you know has a, p a plan to vote. What are you going to do? How are you going to get there? Do not, unless you're told otherwise by a competent authority that you trust, now is no longer the time to vote by mail. It's going to yeah, take too long to that. arrive. Um, drop off your ballot where that service is available or vote early if you can or get ready to vote in person if that's what you're stuck with or if that's what you do anyway. Um, FY, the city of Chicago has announced that the United Center is going to be a super polling place. So go to where the Bulls play. Vote where the Bulls play. That's kind of cool. Um, in other words, to quote John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, this sounds familiar. If it sounds familiar, it should. Do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can. Mm -hmm. There's not a mention of God or Jesus or Peter or Paul in there anywhere. That's just good advice to get through life, which you might also know as chop wood, carry water. 
Chop wood, carry water. Yeah. And it's also some uh, phrase that's used quite a bit by both Hillary Clinton mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Elizabeth Warren, mm-hmm. both United Methodists. Uh, do do what you can. And yeah. uh, we're grateful to everyone who wrote us. And, and there are a number of letters in this pile that we're reading today of people sharing their activism with us. And we are so glad. Yeah. Uh, Drift Class, um, you got an early birthday present yesterday. I did. From there was uh, a certain person who whose name, whose very name, is muted on my Twitter stream yes. so that I do not get tweets about him. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> well, and you might have noticed that if you are a reader of my blog, and of course you should be, um, or if you are a listener to this podcast, I have pretty much shown heroic uh, <laughs> willpower by stopping writing about Glenn Greenwald um, and stop. I don't talk about him much anymore, uh, mostly because I don't care. Um, He has fully transitioned into a Fox News cartoon character. um, And he blocked me on Twitter. He blocked pretty much everybody on Twitter. Everybody who doesn't agree with Glenn got blocked on Twitter after he deleted all of his tweets prior to whatever, 2018. Shortly before that, he he was slagging people who did exactly that sort of thing. So Glenn is a towering hypocrite which anybody who's been paying any attention knows that he is um so i figured the point was made right i mean i'm right i I was on it um etc etc and well this week's events practically begged us to mention glenn one more time because he threw a mighty patented green walled hysterical tantrum and stormed out of the intercept you know, the organization that he founded with the quarter billion dollars he was given by Peter Midiar. That's what I was going to ask you. It's like he he founded that website. He did. He did. And he fucked it up a lot in the beginning and he behaved like an asshole. And I believe at some point they started putting more constraints on him because he was being such an incredibly incompetent manager. Um, and the last I checked, they were begging for money. So um, he's gone from blogger to media mogul back to blogger. Like overnight. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know how he managed to run that thing into the ground. I know that there's some people on there that do excellent reporting. He was not one of them. He wanted it to be his political uh, hobby horse. And he wanted to use it to beat into the ground anybody who disagreed with him. And the people who edit his work finally told him, here's what, here's a limit to what you can do. And he just packed up his shit, threw a tantrum and left. Um Now, what makes this especially noteworthy for me personally uh, is that The Intercept's written response, their press release, reads eerily like everything I've been writing about Glenn Greenwald from years ago. Mm -hmm. Back when I was called Drone Glass, a drooling, jackbooted, obot servant of tyranny. (laughs) Um, And I got slagged and dragged and generally just treated like shit by my allies for pointing out that they were being lied to. That he had an agenda, that he made shit up, that he changed the rules when it didn't suit him, that he he was always arguing in bad faith, always treating anyone who disagreed with him at all as if they were incompetent, lying, scumbag, corrupt, untrustworthy, and that he changed his standards uh, that he applied to himself, um, that he applied to other people. He never applied the rules that he held other people to to himself, ever. And anybody tried to, he and the Greenwald horde would swarm them. So just for fun, uh, I thought I'd read just a paragraph or two from the Intercept's own press release um, where they were dealing in public with Mr. Greenwald's tantrum. Glenn Greenwald's decision to resign from the Intercept stems from a fundamental disagreement over the role of editors in the production of journalism and the nature of censorship. Glenn demands the absolute right to determine what he will publish. He believes that anyone who disagrees with him is corrupt and anyone who presumes to edit his words is a censor. Thus, the preposterous charge that The Intercept's editors and reporters, with the lone noble exception of Glenn Greenwald, have betrayed their mission to engage in fearless investigative journalism because we have been seduced, seduced, mind you, by the lure of a Joe Biden presidency. A brief glance at the stories The Intercept has published on Biden will suffice to refute those claims. The narrative Glenn presents about his departure is teeming with distortions and inaccuracies. My, my, my all of them designed to make him appear as a victim rather than a grown man, a grown person throwing a tantrum. It would take too long to point them all out here, but we intend to correct the record in time. For now, it's important to make clear that our goal in editing his work was to ensure that it would be 
accurate and fair. While he accuses us of political bias, it was he who attempting who who was attempting to recycle the dubious claims of a political campaign, the Trump campaign, and launder them as journalism. Once again, in case this is all familiar to you, this is what I was writing about, Glenn Greenwald, back in 2012, 2013, etc. Right. So, you know, once Chris Hayes hears our podcast, you know he <laughs> listens, I'm sure he'll be inviting me and Bob Setzko on his show um, to yeah. do our little We Told You, you So dance. You should do a special We Told You So podcast. We fucking told Bob you so. Sesko. We fucking told you. And, we're, <laughs> and I have a long list of I Told You So's, but this one yeah. really went right to the top because it really was – so predictable. Yeah. You know, if you dropped a sack of wet cement out of a three-story building, it would not surprise you if it hit the ground with a splat. It should surprise no one that Glenn Greenwald went from being the asshole that he always was to being Tucker Carlson's sidekick on his white power hour to being the guy who stormed out of his own news outfit screaming yeah, censorship. Yeah, that he found it. That he that found, he found it. it. To yeah. go off and be on Substack with Matt Taibbi. So... <laughs> Okay. Great. Hey, people people are making money on the substack. Oh, I'm sure. But anyway, uh Drift Glass. Yes, Blue Gal. Uh <laughs> you have a line in here about David Brooks. We let you go on about Glenn Greenwald. Yes. Just just the first four words of David Brooks's column oh, on Wednesday were enough. hilarious. Fair enough. I, I will not bore you. I have a I wrote a post. Uh most of it was pasted shit I done year, done years ago. I will tell you that that um uh for those of you who've been following this for the 15 plus years I've been writing about it. David Brooks, in my opinion, is engaged in something called the great project, which is mm -hmm. making sure that conservative history, the history of conservatism is completely whitewashed of all the stuff David Brooks doesn't like. And so this week he wrote a column in which the first four words are the most telling mm -hmm. until four years ago. <laughs> History and, began four years ago, everybody. Uh, until four years ago, everybody was well-behaved and nice on both sides. And then something bad happened, and it, this, this wholesale revision of every single thing that's been going on for years and years. I knew it was coming. You knew it mm -hmm. was coming. But this is the new party line. This will be mm -hmm. the new Beltway party line. Anything, and I will not go into any information that you don't already have about Never Trumpers, but I will say that if you're hearing someone – drawing a line across the calendar at 2016 and saying everything right. before that is just off limits now. It was all great back then. Every, just don't, don't, read, don't read anything that I wrote back then, for God's mm -hmm. sake, because mm -hmm. it refutes everything I wrote. But um, then they're lying to you. Mm -hmm. Then they're, they then hold onto your wallets because they're, they're going to stab you in the back and take your money. Um, then, of course, there was a side helping of both siderisms. Mm -hmm. And then it was it was just a fucking typical. But typical. All you had to read to me was the first four words, yeah. and then we were we're done. I mean, yeah. four years ago, that tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. Uh, Drift class in the new New Yorker. We're not going to have time to talk about it, and we might not talk about it next week because I started reading it. Um, <laughs> In the New New Yorker, there is a very long article about the future of the Republican Party. I forget who wrote it, uh -huh. but I will tell you this: I went on for three pages of. New, you know how the New Yorker has three columns per page yeah. and so forth. I had to get to the third page of this article before there was one mention of Barack Obama. Mm. Of course, and you know the few and and there was there was a mention of William F. Buckley Jr. <laughs> and a, and a discourse about Jeb Bush and and the uh, the uh, panache of the Bush family, uh -huh. allowing Jeb to be the uh, front runner until Trump came along. In 2016. Well, I, I would. But nothing about the racism of the Republican no, Party no. until you get to the third page. And then there's one paragraph. Of, oh, yeah, yeah. By the way, Bar Barack Obama was the first black president. And some Republicans were racist about that. I, I would only mention two things uh, related to that, mm -hmm. related to Mr. Brooks's column in the New York Times. One is mm -hmm. read the whole thing. There's no mention of the Republican Party at all. Right. Right. At all. There's right. no mention. The parties don't exist. Nope. Secondly, this one sentence just was like chef's kiss. Uh, those of us in the anti-Trump camp will be smiled upon by history, I imagine. And I just said, okay, oh, now we're okay. done. Now we're yeah. done. Because, you know, we're the <laughs> we're the real heroes. Let's be humble uh, about our, our tremendous he's been heroism. For 30 years. Yeah. He's been the hero of his own story for 30 years. All yeah. right. We have to get to Chuck Todd. Yeah. Um, cat, tip, <laughs> cat tip to a reader and listener who we call that son of a bitch. Yeah. Uh, 
Phil is a great friend of the podcast, has yes. been for years and years and years. And he yeah. wrote me and said, did you catch this Chuck Todd moment? Yeah. And it was Chuck Todd saying, you know, one side takes the coronavirus not seriously enough and the other takes it too seriously, right. meaning Biden, right. because why isn't Biden in battleground states? He's taking this coronavirus too seriously. And well, I just, I just turned on the Twitter and Matt Negrin on Twitter has a clip of Chuck Todd from today. Yep. And Chuck Todd is covering the candidates and where they are live, cutting to here's Joe Biden in wherever, Georgia, mm -hmm. Florida, Texas, wherever he is. I, I, I didn't pay any attention to that, but he was giving a speech. And there he is. Oh, here's Joe Biden, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we did we did two minutes of Joe Biden. Now we're going to do two minutes of Trump in Michigan. Uh-huh. And they cut to, to, to Trump live in Michigan, and the crowd is chanting, lock her up. Yes. It's not a rerun. Ran just random. Just like, you know, okay, now let's cut to Trump, lock her up. Mm -hmm. And they cut back to the Chuck Toddinator 2000. <laughs> And Chuck Toddinator 2000 is massively malfunctioning. Yes, I don't. <laughs> uh, this uh, was, mm. um, you know, we, we just cut to these live and we don't know what they're go the candidate is going to be saying. And, you know, it's really not, I mean, kind of a joke that you would be chanting lock her up, although he says he didn't start the chant. Um, by the way, the governor, you know, had a kidnapping attempt made on her life and that's not i guess that's not you know that's not funny and um uh we we uh cherry picked i mean we didn't cherry pick this particular clip of <laughs> yeah and we'll be right back and it was he just and matt negra just said look you've got to dissolve this show <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, and a, put it out of its misery because he couldn't say, OK, we've done both candidates and you get to choose on Tuesday. Right. It's an either or. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go to both sides? OK, now we've got to go to this commercial for, you know, the next pharma product you're supposed to ask your doctor about. And mm -hmm. he can't do it because. No. Well, I my um, theory. Yeah. My theory is that the Comcast NBC Corporation. Yeah. Um implants a tiny explosive device just at the base <laughs> of the skull. Yeah. And if you if you step off the the uh, party line one inch, uh, they blow you up. Well and they've already demoted him. Yeah. You know, well, so Well it's... not really. They demoted him they demoted his his shitty cable show to instead of fucking up prime time, now it just fucks up midday. But he still midday. is the big boy chair on Meet yeah. the Press. Yeah. He and is. I, I remind everyone that that Chuck neither Chuck Todd nor David Brooks nor any of these people who are just all returning to their default settings, no matter how embarrassing it is. Peggy Noonan, for example, is going to write in um, who is. Oh, I forget who she was going to write in. Uh, but she's not going to vote Biden. She's going to no. write in somebody. No, she's going to. Oh, I have it here. Oh, she's going to write in Edmund Burke. Fuck her. Because she's because because, you know, because she's just too cute by half. Well, and and. Let's. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna use the c don't, word. On don't this use podcast. that word. That's all. Uh, I'm just, it, let's just move on. But everyone, all of but these her, people, her talking about Kamala Harris the way she did this oh God, week yeah. oh. was racist as fuck. Yes, it was. And, and that's all I have to say. And about the reason, it. Right. the reason she has a job is the Wall Street Journal wants her to have that job. The reason David and, Brooke and has a there job. There are a is bunch because... of people like Joe Scar Scarborough that just worship the ground she walks yeah. on because she's a an institution. And she should be in an institution. Now, all, all of the people <laughs> that we talk about on this podcast and all of their fellow travelers exist mm -hmm. in the media hierarchy way up top, way, way, way above us because the corporations that employ them want them there. Chuck Todd right. is on that wall because NBC Comcast wants him there. They want this mm -hmm. kind of shitty coverage. And you can explain it to you blue in the face to people who are mad at Chuck Todd as well. They should be, but they need a both siderist on there to maximize the number of people who won't change the channel between dick pill commercials. Right, right. That's it. That's the reason That's he's it. there. It's not journalism and, in any sense of the word. It is pandering to the cowards in the middle and the lunatics on the right. And fuck the people on the you. left who have the, who own the truth. Thank you. Yes. That's that's why we pay you the big bucks, Drift Glass, for sure. that analysis. And that's, happy birthday, honey. Thank you. Thank you. I'm having and a happy we, birthday, We aren't taking actually. anything away from Drift Glass's birthday by mentioning that Monday is Monday. my 16th blog anniversary. 16th blog -aversary. I joined the blogosphere 16 years ago Monday. Sweet 16, Which was election baby. day. Uh -huh. 
the day that George W. Bush was reelected. Yeah. <laughs> That so was the day. The we've, radical, been, we've been through this. This is the battle scarred person here. You're talking we had, to. We, yeah, that, <laughs> and and Blue Gal has been holding up the liberal blogosphere personally for 16 years. <laughs> no, Seriously. I haven't. Ser- no, she holds up this guy. She holds up. No, this guy. I don't. Uh, she she is. A, I have a lot of help. <laughs> she's a terrific blogger. She basically keeps Crooks and Liars running. She's a terrific sound editor. We would not have a podcast if it were not for her. Oh, thank um, you, honey. And on and on, on. She's a great writer. We used to have a salon. You used to have a salon oh, in your place. Yeah. I would come and visit. It was just you were she, all flirty with me back I was, then. I was. It was great. <laughs> I was married and yeah, in a bad marriage and. Mm-hmm. Drift Glass was just a nice man who I knew had so many women chasing after him. I never had a chance. Yeah, but you know, you had the you're the big brain. <laughs> she had the big brain, and then I had the big brain, and the then big writer's he brain. started what? to be flirty. And then uh, I guess we should say this that yeah. uh, Captain Dyke was the yes. one. She was my wingman who said, "Oh no, he likes you." Yeah, but <laughs> so I knew it was, was impossible <laughs> because she was married, and I did not go after married ladies. And no, you did not go after married, married ladies. And oh. then I got a divorce, and then we oh. we were like, oh. Hello. And then I moved to Illinois. Woo. And then some number of years later, you're listening to this podcast. So yeah, that's how and, and we've been married nine years. Yeah. So that's well, kind of and, a long story. And and our podcast will be 11 years old in January. January. That's right. 11 years. Old. So your podcast, um, or I'm sorry, your your blog, come Monday, will it turn all sullen and monosyllabic? Yeah, it'll be all. It's going to be a teenager. You know, it's going to yeah. be. A, it's going to have have to go through now it's uh it's eye rolling, adolescent years eye rolling eye rolling adolescent says. years at 16 yes right i didn't ask to be blogged mom <laughs> <laughs> so you know he, he's talking about a certain person and be house. ready for it Who's, no, who is going she's no. doing just fine oh i'm talking about me when i was six. i'm oh, talking about you. everybody okay. everybody when they're 16 or give or take that i know went through this in that range yep. so we're just looking forward to uh your your blog Rolling its eyes and yeah. sighing deeply at the unfairness <laughs> of it all. You and know? unless we get a teenage cat, this is the last one. Yes. Well, so, no, yeah. that, that's a lie, and you know it. We're going to have foster kids in this house. Oh, We're going to have gosh. nieces and nephews and grandkids. Yes, this this house true. will have kids all the time. It will. That's why we're getting rid of the bats because you can't have babies. <laughs> hey, and the bats bat guy and... came yesterday. He did. And we thank you to everyone who's donated. Yeah. Uh, I think we need another $500, but I think your birthday money will probably take yeah. care of that i asked him if he would like scotch in trade and he looked at me like no <laughs> he said no no i get paid <laughs> like, like a normal person money. <laughs> okay you know this is but not boy, taxable he did a good job he sealed up the whole house yeah. got everything got the pipe in the ex- yeah. exit pipe for the bats to fly out and they can't yeah. fly back in right and uh sealed up all of the uh flashing openings and flashing, flashing and yeah. so forth yeah. where they might get in and uh told us that the back part of our house they didn't do a good job on the roof and they did you know at he, some he point we'll have to have that done but not did, today <laughs> not today drift glass and i did not my today. part i went out there every, a couple times and went so how's it going and uh he told me <laughs> and then i went back inside because i don't know shit about sealing up a house we don't bats. know shit about sealing up the house from bats but no. it is sealed bat season ends tomorrow yes uh and he said you know the bats will fly out they won't be able to fly back into the house and they'll find another place to go and we didn't kill any of them, so as far and as we know. So, if you're looking for our house in the next 24 hours, I have a ginormous <laughs> sign in the front yard that my brother. I tweeted it. I'll put it on. Fa- yeah. I'll put it on our Facebook page too. It is your brother. You it's didn't this, want anything fancy no. or, or splashy for your no. birthday, and there's like this 17 foot sign out in front of our house yeah. that says "Happy 60th Birthday." It's visible so. from Google Earth. Okay, from Google Just Earth, saying. absolutely. Uh, okay, so letter show. This is letters. our letter show. Thank you for your letters. But Yogi Barrister, we're going to start with him because yeah. he wrote lyrics to a song you might have heard. And so we're going to – Drift Glass did the lyrics and we did a little audio of it and here it is. Uh, I just want to make sure that you understand anything wrong with the lyrics or bat is entirely my fault. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's great, it starts with a shit shake, jerks and jakes and gravy trains, and Tammy Bruce is unrestrained. I have a clusterfuck, listen to yourself, Chuck, liar service own crooks, don't believe David Brooks, took it up a notch, hook grind, no clutch, Dowd flitters to the Twitter with a fear of flight, uptight tire in a fire, the dumpster's overflowing, and Glenn Greenwald's for hire on a Russian site. Left turn, don't run over Nita Turner, with the burners, drink all my scotch. 
Year by year, the cornfields trampled, trumpled, feathered, and tarred. Look at the low bar down there. Uh-oh, undertow, copulation lobby group. But I'll do, save our town, serve our town, chop wood, carry water. Listen to your middle daughter. Tell me that the pundits spewing pablum from the past past. My vitriolic podcast, cages of brass, space shards ass. Luke Al is a pretty lass. It's the end of the world as I know it. It's the end of my 50s and I show it. It's the end of the world as I know it. And I feel fine. Thank you, Yogi Barrister. That just, was awesome. I wish I could have done you, you know, more proud. Uh, but really, I'm just a tone poem reading kind of guy. And I can't read that fast anymore. I'm old now. <laughs> He's I, old now. I, He's gone, 60. He's old now. <laughs> I've gone in one day. I've gone from the enfant terrible of the liberal blogosphere to the amenance grise of the liberal blogosphere. So, you yeah. know, I'm just putting my feet up going, hey, you fuckers do the work. I'm done <laughs> working on this stuff. I'm <laughs> over it. I'm retired. I'm out of it. I'm going to just do podcasts and blogging about, oh, I don't know, stuff that I read, stuff that I see on the floor. I don't know. Um, but today, we're going to read letters from our yeah, awesome listeners. Yeah, and I'll start. I'm going to read Carl's letter. Okay, fire away. This is from Carl. When people ask me if I am Antifa, I explain it this way. My father landed on the shores of France on D-Day, Third Army, Purple Heart, wounded three times. My mother was trained by the Army as a combat nurse. Uncle Art was an engine man in the North Atlantic. Uncle Bernie flew in the 8th Air Force. And somehow they all lived through it. So yes, being anti-fascist is kind of a family tradition. Why aren't you? That's a really good <laughs> Thank question. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> uh, and Tom with an H writes, Love your show. and glad you're here in Illinois. I have no suggestions relative to the show since I agree with just about everything both of you say. I am captured by your sensitivity to media persuasion through archetypes and smokescreen needed to forward unpopular ideas and characters. I'm sorry, needed to forward unpopular ideas and characters in the United States, as well as your sense of purpose. I'm from rural industrial Indiana, Muncie area, and left rural life, but behind, uh, but behind by latitude. I'm living in Chicago 30 plus years now. I tried moving back to the country near Princeton, Illinois, Reagan country. It lasted less than one year. I'm sure your stories of arrival are quite interesting relative to the barren aspects of Springfield. Yeah, I I moved to Springfield because for one very specific reason, my ex-husband was here on business a lot. Uh -huh. I wanted to get out of Alabama and Springfield was a place that I could move to where my ex was coming on a regular basis for business. So I was taking the kids away from Alabama, but not to Timbuktu. He would still be here on business and see the children frequently. And that's mm -hmm. why I moved to Springfield. It was a very sure. specific reason. And you moved down to Springfield from Chicago uh, because you fell in love. I did. I <laughs> fell in love with this lovely lady and her wonderful kids. And I was living in Chicago and working in Chicago and working in Chicago at about a third of what I was making when I worked for the city. Mm -hmm. um, so I was sort of um, negatively cash flowing my way into um, uh, not quite the red, but really, really down low, uh, mm -hmm. making it. But, you know, I was I was commuting down here every weekend. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was, you know, loving the life down here because it's slow and it's sort of eye level. Um, the politics around here are really easy to understand. Um, yeah. I liked the people I saw down here. I, I liked the schools. I liked the neighborhoods. I liked the walkability of it. I don't, I love Chicago. I will always mm -hmm. love Chicago. I will always right. go back to Chicago. You and I might move up there someday. Um, but right now, um, it's the perfect place to raise these kids yeah. and to be with this wonderful woman. And keeping a condo in Chicago on not on less on, than on uh, no money, <laughs> on no money, yes. um, was not uh, up on the uh, up in uh, uh, the north side. Yeah, was not viable. And so yeah. this just made all kinds of good sense in every way you can imagine. And honestly, hopping two or three trains to get down here mm -hmm. and back or driving back and forth is no way to live. No. Um, so no. And this that, was home. This became yeah. home when yeah, when you fell in love with me and the kids. Well, yeah. and I knew, you know, it started being that way when I would turn the corner of a specific street and my heart would just go, oh. <laughs> you, you noticed your blood pressure drop. It would just drop. I'm, I'm home. Yeah. I'm yeah. home. Yeah. And um, yeah. we'd have a Blue Moon burger yep. and watch Rachel Maddow 
And yep. I was just always incredibly happy to be here. And so that made the choice really easy. Also, Halloween's down here were amazing. Uh, in oh my, my building, gosh. I had two kids in the building who would come upstairs from the condo below me. And that would be my trick or treat. When I was a kid, it was, you know, kids were everywhere all the time. The yeah. first Halloween I spent down here, there were hundreds of kids on the block. Yeah. I had to go back yeah. to the store for bags of candy like twice, I think. Yep. Um, we usually have 75 kids yeah. on Halloween at least. So it, it it's, depends. Last year it snowed on Halloween, but this year it'll be better. Yeah. And uh, they've, they've given us guidelines. We have to put a table at the end of our driveway and stand on one side of the table mm-hmm. and uh, have the candy out so they can take one and – uh, no con that way there's no contact. It'll, I have a it'll, big it'll impressive out. sword I'll have with me. So you know, it'll be great. <laughs> anyway, moving on. All right. Yes. Uh, Seth has written us and said, Drift Class, I don't have much more to say than one happy birthday. Two, I wish I'd started donating to your show earlier. And three, vote Democrat. Thank you, Seth. From old friend Zombie Rotten McDonald. Yeah. Um, you asked about how people are coping. Until you asked, I didn't realize I had had a disruption to sleep. I have had a series of surrealistic, I mean more than usual, and very weird dreams that usually wake me up. Hmm. After hearing your question, I realized it was stress dreams, reacting to a less than rational world with less than rational responses. We are coping somewhat. We are both fortunate that we both do work that can be done from home, and we can afford high speed broadband and so uh, to so to do so i also have an office a few minutes way downtown and since i'm currently a sole practitioner it's relatively low risk and the building is small it has six suites on two floors and three of those are vacant mm. so when i start to feel a little stir crazy i go in for a day where i can listen to loud music with no repercussions good for you but when it comes to coping what i miss most of all is live music I once had a friend say to me, if I cut you, you will bleed music, won't you? I've seen thousands of bands in venues all over the country, large and small. Biggest shows uh, was Springsteen on the River Tour. Smallest one was Eon McCarthy from Whiskey of the Damned playing on my deck. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I usually get f- uh, full passes to Summerfest, and it is hardly unusual for me to attend nine out of 11 of those days. All of that stopped in March. The last show we saw as a couple was They Might Be Giants at the Paps Theater. The last show I saw was John Langford and Sally Timms with Dean, I won't even attempt to pronounce his last name. maybe? Um, yeah. At Anodyne Coffee. I haven't gone seven months without seeing live music since I went to college, I think. Hmm. Thankfully, musicians are just as frustrated as we are about it. John Langford has been finding ways to do something online, even if it has to be filmed on his deck. Robin Hitchcock and his partner, Emma Swift, do a weekly show. And Emma just released a perfectly lovely album of Dylan covers called Blonde on the Tracks. That's very clever. He says clever, yeah, that right? Is. That is really clever. Yeah. Um, which f- has featured my favorite song of the pandemic year, I Contain Multitudes. Dino, again, I'm not going to pronounce his last name right. One of the Shlaba- Waco- Shlabowski. Shlabowski, I think it is. Yeah. I, I'll take your word for it, and I'm not even going to try <laughs> Um, One of the Waco brothers has been staking out space as heir to Woody Guthrie with Mm. strident agit folk with three albums released online for whatever you want to pay, which like a true commie Uh, (laughs) since that terrible day in 2106, which he can't possibly mean 2106. No, he must mean 2016. 2016. Many other musicians, unless he's a time traveler, which is not (laughs) impossible. Many other musicians are finding ways to get uh, that main line high connecting with an audience. One of my most favorite bands in the world, the Mekons, have also been living in the eight corners of the world for several decades, found inspiration in isolation and a way to make more new music, uh, parenthetically coming on the heels of a very fine album recorded in the American Southwest called Desert uh, Deserted. I'm sorry, not Desert Land, Deserted. So yeah, turns out my response is the same as usual under difficult times, to turn to music. Huh. I guess I'm nothing if not predictable. Oh, yeah. I also turn to a particular podcast once a week. Thank you for that, Zombie Rotten McDonald. You are most welcome. And I included that whole letter because there's so many good suggestions for what yeah. to listen to in that letter. I thought people would want to hear it. Well, especially right. these these few days before the election when we're begging you, please don't obsess over the numbers and things right. you can't control. Do yeah. something that will make you feel good. 
Because make some I, phone calls for yeah. your can for your congressional candidate, and then turn on some music or read a novel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Lawrence has written us. I look forward to the return of science fiction university. Yes, we do too. We guilt, do guilt, too. guilt. I think the past four years have been lean times for the genre. Reality has intruded on imagination. We have lived in a Philip K. Dick dystopia, which is now turning into the world of the Andromeda strain. Unfortunately, this was created by the butterfly effect of James Comey's <laughs> last minute announcement in October 2016 concerning a laptop and her emails. The world has changed just as Ray Bradbury foresaw. Although we must be wary of underestimating the unexpected, this time it will be different. The conflict between free and civil society and the Magarians, I like that, Magarians, is being decided by nature's most primitive life forms, <laughs> <laughs> the virus, yeah, as good point. H.G. Wells imagined in The War of the Worlds. This is why we need Science Fiction University. It makes the news roundup and your excellent weekly analyses somehow make sense. Happy birthday and best wishes to all your family, Lawrence. Thank you, Lawrence. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is the anniversary of the War of the Worlds. Yeah. Uh, The the, uh, Halloween radio broadcast by Orson Welles that scared the shit out of millions of people on the East Coast. This weekend. Yes, that's right. I believe it was today. Yeah, today. Uh, Read R.C.'s letter. R.C. made phone calls to Florida voters on behalf of the Democrats, which is yay. Yay. Uh, And here's the letter. Pretty interesting. I thought I was going to be getting uh, into Lincoln-Douglas-style debates with people, but a lot of people just needed basic info on where to go and when to vote and to remind them to vote. I also had wrong numbers, so it was good to help the Florida party clean up the list. There were some who were angry that they were getting called all the same. I think they may have- All the time. Oh, all, all, I'm sorry, getting called all the time. I think that may have to do with better coordination of the party with other groups. I've been doing phone banking. I couldn't agree more. A ton of wrong numbers, a ton of law offices for some reason, and Hmm. real estate offices, um, and answering machines. One person had been dead for years. Just, but it's, you know, I've done this before and it's fairly typical that that's the error ratio. But when you get one or two or three people who either tell you, I love your candidate, I've already voted, or yes, I plan to vote, and you can check that box, feels great, man. Feels just great. Okay. uh, You read Jay's letter also. Jay says, happy birthday, Drift Glass. I turned 61 yesterday, the 24th. In case you aren't aware, that's United Nations Day. I bet John Bolton is not aware. <laughs> if you have analog calendars, some percentage of them will have the day note. No, I'm sorry. If you have analog calendars, some percentage of them will have the day noted as such. A wise friend once said to me, it's not a national holiday because it's about peace. Yeah. Hearing Obama's plain spoken observations about fuckface von Clownstick, credit John Stewart, yesterday and today, I suddenly became hyper aware of how mind bendingly surreal things have become. Of course, the business as usual uh, mainstream media coverage hasn't helped. Over and over and over, I thought he surely had, I have to flip the page now, I apologize, done all the evil, heartless, destructive things that he could possibly do, but this evil idiot is much more creative than I could have imagined. Have you ever been so full of rage you actually go blind? Me neither. But with the increasingly breathtaking cruelty being compounded daily, I ran out of breath. I have long treasured your therapy every week. Thank you. And now for something completely different. In the 90s, I worked as a drummer on a cruise ship. But right now, I want to tell you a true story about my other job. When I was not at sea, I worked at an L.A. motorcycle messenger. One fine summer day, I was delivering to an office building on the west side. And once I boarded the elevator, I found myself standing next to James Doohan. Scotty. Scotty himself. (laughs) I interacted with lots of celebrities on the job. My personal policy was not to bug people just going about their business. I was an original Star Trek fan, so it was hard to pretend Scotty wasn't standing right there. After making my delivery, my next stop was another office building about 20 miles away in the valley. I got in the elevator, and standing next to me was DeForest Kelly. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) I know. What are the odds? This time I had to speak. I was just in another elevator with James Doohan. He turned his head toward me, and not missing a beat, he asked dryly, did you tell him to beam you up? (laughs) Ah, that DeForest Kelly. 
Uh, much um, love from Jay, also known as Jazz Idiot on Twitter. Thank you, Jay. That's wonderful. Uh, we got a letter from Heather, who is one of my uh, Twitter buddies. Mm-hmm. Dear GG and BG, Ten Grain made me use your initials. <laughs> <laughs> Has he ever been a guest on your podcast? Would he ever be willing to be a guest? I will tell you, Heather, that Ten Grain is on my very short list. If anything ever happens to Drift Glass, I'm going to do a podcast with Ten Grain. That's it. So the answer is no, because the competition would be be brutal. I'd I'd feel very jealous the whole time. No, I would love to have Ten Grain on. Yeah, he's a he's a hoot, and we just he is also one of the greatest uh, community builders on the internet, as far as I'm concerned. Just amazing guy. One of the pillars, really. One of the one of the old school pillars of the internet, and uh, so sure, we'd love to have Ten Grain on, uh, but. He's also just on my very, very short list of future podcast partners. Uh, uh, you know, we'll, we we hope that ne- that's never necessary. I pl- I plan to die first, by the yeah. way. So you know, we we have that is the only fight Drift Glass and I really have is who's mm-hmm. going to die first, and we always fight that. No, it's going to be me. <laughs> no, I go first. <laughs> I go first. No, I wanted to say happy birthday to Drift Class. This is Heather again. I wanted to say happy birthday to Drift Class. He'll die laughing when I still remember he didn't want his stepdaughters to hear Shape of You by Ed Sheeran. Mm-hmm. He should check out I Want Your Sex by George Michael. <laughs> no, I shouldn't. No. <laughs> rock and roll is evil. It's going to ruin these kids. <laughs> these kids with their rock and roll. I've been listening to you for quite a while. This quote unquote presidency has taught me so much more than I ever wanted to know about the Republican Party. Yeah, I know know how you feel. Yep. I'm in Michigan. I have a cool governor, Gretchen Whitmer, but my legislature has made her powerless. Yes, they're Republicans. The Michigan GOP should be fully charged with aiding and abetting the plot to murder her, in my opinion. The state legislature's leader and one of his cohorts were at the Let's Open Everything event last April. Those who plotted to kill Whitmer met there, I believe. I voted up blue, up and down the ballot. I have been for a long time. I recently posted something about Rashida Tlaib and Bernie Sanders coming to Michigan to get progressives to vote Joe. I saw Bernie speaking a couple weeks ago online. He sounded really energetic and like he really cares. I am sure he does. As does Rashida. I'm quite happy that Bernie and Rashida want to help us get a President Biden. Yes, I voted blue up and down the ballot. It's sad that two people I voted for may not be liked in the city I live in. Mm -hmm. They're black. Mm -hmm. It's quite a divide here in the area I live in. To make a long story short, these candidates came over to St. Joseph, Michigan, to pass out literature and campaign, and someone called the police on them. It ended up being fine. The police wished them good luck. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so glad to hear that, that that's how it ended up. I'm very sorry that someone called the police on two candidates for public office because of the color of their skin. I want to just, I want to go back to something Heather said that just struck me, which is, Mm So much more than I ever wanted to know about the Republican Party. Yeah. I, yeah. You know why we hired a bat guy? Because I don't know how to get bats out of my house. Right. I don't – I don't. I feel, really feel I don't – I shouldn't have to know every little thing about a fucking political party to know if they're evil or not. Right. And, right. And right. if you just if you just peel back the very surface of the Republican Party, it's evil all the way down. It's rotten all the way down. And mm-hmm. it, it – you shouldn't have to have to do – long hours of research into holy shit they've been this bad forever the fact yeah. that they've been this bad forever should be part of our national conversation well i think it is i think it's becoming that yeah. I, I especially with young people i think yes. it's becoming that and there was a tweet today i don't know who sent it but i it struck me they they were saying uh, i i'm really looking forward to having no idea who joe biden's postmaster general <laughs> is i know i know You know, that that level of ignorance and the fact that, you know, that group of seventh graders that I had for their uh, scholastic bowl all knew who Betsy DeVos was. They every one of these seventh graders had to know that because she's doing so many bad things to our education system. And, uh, yeah, we just don't need that. (laughs) Well, and that's why I, I know I'm pedantic, but I'm adamant that if you are a person with 
a, a, a leg in the media, a foot in the mm-hmm. media. You've got a, you've got a spotlight on you, and you are, and your, uh, your, your uh, thing is. It all started in 2016. It all began yeah, in 2016. Right. First of all, you were lying, and you goddamn well know you're lying, and you're mm-hmm. and you're lying out of guilt and fear and shame. And secondly, if we all pretend this all started in 2016, we're never going to be able to fix it. No, it's like pretending right. the, the COVID started yesterday. It didn't. Right. It, it didn't. didn't. No. And and no. we have to go back to where it started to understand how we got here. And people who work against that are working against actually fixing the problem out of the worst motives you can imagine. So thanks. That that really struck me, Heather. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, LT writes, happy B-Day, Drift Glass. Well, thank you, LT. You guys are the only thing that kept me sane after the disaster that was November 2016. I couldn't listen to Stephanie or Bob Seska, but I could listen to you and your missus. Well, thank you. After 15 years at a gaming company in Las Vegas, I was laid off on May 1st. We decided to move back to Texas, both Hubby and I are native Texans, and quickly sold our townhouse and moved to San Antonio. I registered and voted on the second day of early voting. Texas only allows vote by mail if you are over 65. Keep up the good work. You've kept me sane for the last few years. And I want I wanted to add LT's letter to this because we have heard from people who couldn't listen to us for a while yes. because things were just getting too much. And so this was no rag on Stephanie or Bob Seska, no, no. but it's a personal choice to listen to a podcast or not. And we understand if you need to take a break because things are just too hard from time to time. And so this person saying that if I couldn't listen to this podcast or this podcast, but yours I could digest, you know, there, there are times you're not going to be able to listen to all the politics. You just aren't able to. And we totally get it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're here every week because this is our obsession. <laughs> yeah, and it's a labor love. <laughs> you and know, we're doing it on Drift Class's birthday. We podcasted on our wedding day because we it was Friday. We did. You know, this is just what we do. And uh, it is a labor of love. And uh, we, we love each other and we love doing it. So, all right. Uh, Brian wrote us. I am a 60-year-old black man from the rural area of East Tennessee. I was too young to have suffered the indignities of legal segregation. Not that there wasn't social segregation to be adhered to. I was a child of that first wave of integration. Aside from kindergarten and daycare, I never attended any all-black educational system. Despite being the only black child in my class for several years, I was never bullied or harassed. In fact, there were only 10 black kids in my K-8 through school. I attended through grade 5. We may not have been invited to birthday parties, but we were otherwise left alone. When I attended middle, middle school, the social segregation became more noticeable. In the 7th grade, I was denied the speaking role of Denmark Vesey in a play about the slave uprising in South Carolina. I was a field hand, while the white kid was the doomed slave. <laughs> I was very popular and well liked, voted class governor in the eighth grade and class vice president in high school. As most high school's cafeterias, ours was divided by jocks, rah rahs, and, and the stoners. Yep. Of course, the blacks were separate from those groups, except for the jocks. In 1986, I moved to Nashville as I was unable to find any employment not fast food related in my hometown. My first job was with an evangelical organization called World Bible Society. This was the first time I had encountered people that believed the world was 6,000 years old. There were other religious semi-cults that sort of melded at this organization. One was Tony Alamo, a charlatan that had followers tithing 75% of their take-home pay to live in his apartments, not to mention he was trying to bring his dead wife back to life. I saw the exploiting of the gullible in 1988 when World Bible Society published and distributed 88 Reasons the World Will End in 1988. God, that's now now Buzzsprout, so Buzzfeed got it. (laughs) Buzzfeed, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Some of the workers took it literally and sold everything to go to the Rockies and await the rapture. Mm -hmm. The owner and other bigwigs had a huge party on a yacht. (laughs) Of course they did. Yeah. Uh, At the appointed time of the rapture. So I truly understand the term reprogrammable meat puppets. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, my earliest recollection of the voting process is my grandmother voting in 1968. I became aware of the party structure in 72 after watching the conventions. By 1974, having watched the Watergate hearings and Nixon's resignation, I was a Democrat. I have voted for the Democratic nominee in every election since 1980. I am feeling uncertain about the election. While I am certain if Trump wins, we will be in the ATM category. No, ATM in in this reference is not automated teller. I feel squeamish saying ass to mouth, but no other term (laughs) describes the upgrade from the fucking we have endured since 2017. Mm -hmm. Never could I have imagined the rift this man has created in this country. Lifelong relationships tossed aside for an individual that is a living sin. Yeah. Lastly, happy birthday, Drift Class. Uh, Let me add to this that we received a very uh, large paper packet from one listener who wrote down, and he just forwarded this on to us for our information, but Mm -hmm. he wrote this for his grandchildren. And it's a uh, diary, pretty much, or or an essay Mm -hmm. about every presidential election and how he voted and why he voted that way. A journal, a journal, really. And it's a journal. And and I just recommend that as a great way, if you don't know how to start writing your your life history, or you want to write a personal history for your descendants, your grandchildren, whoever, uh, starting with that as a framework is a great idea. You know, I, I started voting in fill in the year and, and talk about it that way. Um, it gives you a lot of history. I know, uh, my ex husband's papers that he, uh, gave to the state historical library of Illinois. And there's a long story behind that, but a couple of them mentioned, uh, Lincoln and those papers, you know, because they're that old, the family papers are that old. Mentioning these are, you know, contemporary accounts of President Lincoln from people who were talking about President Lincoln at the time. Those letters had to be taken out, verified, and, uh, you know, put through a, a historical test. And actually, uh, we had to find out the financial value of them in order to donate them to the library. They had to be assessed. So, Writing something down that mentions, you know, President Trump is president and here's how I feel about him down the road, having that contemporary information is going to be very valuable to historians. So I do recommend writing that down. Uh, And this thank you so much for that letter, Brian. That was awesome. Yeah. Very glad to hear from you. The idea of of Trump as a living sin is just. Yeah. That's that's perfect. That's very poetic. Thank you. Um. Doug writes from California and the Santa Ana winds and fire. And he says, sorry, I didn't ma- email you earlier, but PG&E decided that its power infrastructure was too dangerous to operate when the wind blows and cut off our power Sunday night. At least it came back on for a couple of hours earlier than when they projected. So what did I have to show for 37 hours of solitude, as it were? Well, that would be 475 campaign emails in my in, in my inbox. Listen, I know that email is a big factor in what's driving the massive influx of money to Democrats are currently surfing, hopefully to victory on, but the tone of too many of them is beyond annoying. As I perhaps might be more likely to take your pointless online survey if I didn't have 474 more goddamn emails to read before I could even activate my new phone. Oh, did I mention I got a new phone? PG&E was down for the count, but FedEx was Johnny on the spot. Yeah. The pointless online surveys, I don't understand what how that works with well, people. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> I want your email. I want your email address. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 And, and it costs nothing. I mean, if you spam a That's million right. people off of your server, yeah. off of your email, it just, it costs nothing. Yep. Yep. All right. You read Pamela's letter, please. I will. Pamela writes, hello, DGBG. I've been reading and enjoying Drift Glass's blog pretty much its whole life. I was an early adopter of the fun podcast. And now, even though I'm unemployed via the pandemic, I'm still a supporter on Patreon. Thank you so much, Pamela. Oh, Pamela, bless your heart. Thank you. It's only fair. I listen to each new podcast every day in the week and twice on Fridays. It's cheap sanity insurance. Listening to you two share insights and banter with obvious love for each other, your family, and your kitties is one of the highlights of the week I can always look forward to. As someone in more or less the same age cohort, may I say, the best is yet to come. (laughs) 
I interpret that all caps to mean that. At least I hope so. Greetings from my own Mr. and the five rescue cats. Hope in uh, yours in hope and love, Pam. On a professional note, drift class might be constantly tripped by Bosco out of love. Kittens are roadblocks for their mother when they're hungry or lonely. In cat speak, it's for you are my mama in case it helps. Pamela, oh. it doesn't help at all. But thank you so much for <laughs> – no, just he's, kidding. He, he's rubbing up against your ankles because he he wants you to feed him for sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. We have a letter here from Jim. Dear Drift Class and Blue Gal, happy birthday, Drift Class. 60 is a big deal, but you are only as old as you feel. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Uh, what attracted me first was your appreciation for Frank Herbert. I am his number one fan. I have a theory that what you read at 15 settles deep inside and can direct your life's thinking. Drift class, you need to read everything he and his son have written. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh, no. We are we are listening to the audiobook of Dune right now. Yes. We're more than halfway through, and I mm-hmm. am enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have never read Dune before. I know people are real mad at me about that, but we're uh, getting through it. It was, in yes. our, it was in our prenup that you will read Dune before our 10th anniversary, so... <laughs> Got to hurry up. Come on, let's go. Got to hurry up. This year, we got to do it. <laughs> if you do not read it all, you will not never fully understand the Duncan Idaho character. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jim. We, we get it. I cared deeply about this world and made sure my life's work had meaning. As a software engineer and statistician at IBM, I was proud that our supercomputers were forecasting weather and simulating nuclear exp- explosions without the need to actually blow them up. My current employer manufactures everything, including COVID test kits, at one every five seconds. Wow. Thank you for the work your company's doing. I look forward to your podcast more than any other show each week. I love you both. We love you back. And appreciate your cheerful analysis, jokes, and advice on how to get through these awful times. Everyone should memorize the news roundup to be ready for the inevitable conversions with right-wingers during the week. I think you mean conversations with right-wingers during the week. Well, we can hope for conversions, but it's not going to happen. Conversions, right. Mm -hmm. I'm in Florida now, and I get to interact regularly with the Mm right-wing. Yes, I'm sure you do. (laughs) My wife and I have had the joy of having our Biden line stolen by a crazy neighbor. Thankfully, another neighbor brought it back, (laughs) ratted out the culprit, and we are displaying again. (laughs) I had a the pure joy recently of arguing with a Trump supporter and happily watched him accept I was right about everything. Of course, it was a waste of time, but a pleasure nonetheless. Trump is supported by white people without college degrees. They heard him say he will save their jobs and their manufacturing plant. That's all they heard. They are not as racist as we think they are. They are racist. It's just that it is not the core issue. They want a world where you can have a high school diploma, work four years to earn a respectful position with seniority, and with that seniority, a person can ride out their remaining working years without worrying about losing your job and then retire with a pension. And I should add, being a white male. Yeah. You know, that is, so that's where the racism and, and misogyny comes in. Mm-hmm. Bill Clinton signed NAFTA and Barack Obama signed the TPP. Ross Perot told them they would hear a giant sucking sound and Hillary told them the truth. The coal jobs are not coming back. No surprise they don't see Democrats as a serious solution, meaning they want their high school diploma to guarantee them, you know. Uh, the, the job their dad the had job of their, their job ago. their dad had, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, and I understand that, sure. You are right about everything, and it's a crying shame our media does not have you on every day. However, you are heard. More importantly, you are that crazy mix of sociologist, historian, psychologist that Isaac Asimov described in Foundation. He's Uh-oh. talking about you, Drift Class. Harry Seldon? You're talking about Harry Seldon? Yeah. yeah Don't okay. Harry Seldon me. Yeah. Don't, Harry Seldon. <laughs> yes. Don't Harry Seldon me, bro. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's very kind. Uh, You are seeing the future and seeing what will happen. Thank God you haven't had to tell us all to head for Canada (laughs) because the dark ages are coming. We hear you and glad you are there. We may never get the rest of the world to hear the message. It's just a sad reality. However, we can make changes, chop wood and carry water. I had a few small wins this year. I convinced my cafeteria to work to replace their plastic straws with with, uh, paper ones. 
The big win was to convince my management to create new positions for manufacturing employees to take on temporary assignments in engineering. That's a great idea. Yeah. This is for employees taking classes in their local community college. They get 20 hours a week to work in their desired field. It gives engineering the extra help they need. It demonstrates a pathway to higher paying jobs where to everyone in manufacturing. It gives us all hope. That is drift glasses, you know, when I just touched his heart. When I, when I worked for the city of Chicago, I did a whole bunch of work. I did tech work. I did mapping work. I did strategic mm-hmm. planning work. My wheelhouse was manufacturing, a training and reinvestment, uh, opening up a manufacturing high school, opening up a manufacturing mm-hmm. work center to do exactly this. So you right. really, you, you, you really touched his heart with you that. You really one. did. And, and the idea that you would give manufacturing, you know, low skill manufacturing jobs, 20 hours a week to go to community college oh. and then get trained as an engineer so that you actually get a promotion and a better job and a better yeah. future. That's and, exactly what the whole country needs to and be a doing. Good and it's, business- a good business owner knows that that is just going to redound to their benefit 10 Absolutely. years down the road. Absolutely. That, yeah. that, you know, you'll have trained employees mm-hmm. who are loyal to you and uh, will we'll bring more profit into the build, building. Absolutely. Continue around with Jim's letter. I pray that Trump is just a temporary backlash to Obama, that now we will see the future and progress toward it. We will go bowling with our friends from work and be proud of the crazy diversity that is America that we will see that we are truly blessed. I am blessed to have you in my life, and I can't thank you enough for all you do. Love, Jim. Thank you so much, Jim. You know, Jim. What a nice letter. I have a, I have a plan for a sequel to The Bachelor. Um, <laughs> it's called The Baccalaureate, and the winner gets a college education and never, ever votes for Trump again. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. And, nice. And everyone's a winner because everyone gets at least a bachelor's degree, and you all get your college loans forgiven. So that's nice. That's my yeah. plan. Uh, I don't. I don't know if they're not taking my calls at NBC anymore, so I'll have to shop it around. <laughs> um, KG writes, "Drift glass and blue gal, I have been reading you all for a long time, and let me just say, you two are the most eloquent progressive voices out there. I just joined your Patreon. Thank you very much." I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and it is so devastatingly depressing listening to my colleagues and fellow church members justify conservative viewpoints. What is most depressing is that my family has only been in this country for a little over 100 years. My dad's family came from Ireland, and my mom's family came from Italy. I see my relatives who worked hard and became successful turn into these horrible Trumpers. Italians weren't considered Caucasians until the 1920s. It is so embarrassing. The racism coming from them is horrible, and their memories are so short when they were treated like crap from the majority. I just found out about the assassination attempt on Joe Biden. These months, I really fear for the lives of some prominent liberal voices. There are going to be more Gretchen Whitmer situations. I really think so. They're not going to go quietly. The conservative majority got their judges in the last five to six years, but their PT cruiser brigades are not going to be happy. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's talking about the assassination attempt. What I'm not familiar. I know that that Trump talked about Biden getting shot, and yeah. we have that video of Trump saying that over at Crooks and Liars. If you yeah. want to see it, it's horrible. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, there's a lot of really irresponsible crap coming yeah. out of that man's mouth. Well, and, and Charlie uh, Pierce talks about the madness that's been turned loose in the country. And it, it's mm-hmm, going to, mm-hmm. it's going to land some, it's going to land a lot of places. It's going to make, it's going to be very unpleasant and very unhappy and dangerous for, in some places for a while to come. These are, this is the rump brigade of the civil war. Yeah. These are the yeah. people who, who put on clan hoods and decided to keep on terrorizing people long after they'd mm-hmm. lost the war, because that's all they knew how to do to keep their right. life the way they wanted it. Right. And and we know, Drift Glass, because we remember before 2016. We do. That in 2009, the FBI came out with a report talking about right wing militia groups being a terrorist threat to the United States of America. Which was and immediately and graciously accepted by the right as a proper critique. You no. Know, something that, that law enforcement really needed to look after. No, it was not. Rick no. Hume and Michelle Malkin lost their shit. Mm-hmm. And called it censorship, mm-hmm. and 
it all had to be dialed back because you, how dare you say that right wingers are a danger to America? It, it, this is what sadly we have learned from the right Yeah, is if you are terrifying enough and if you throw a big enough tantrum and if you get right up in Chuck Todd's face and scream at him and mm -hmm. make him shit his pants, he will change his mind. He will yeah. take you seriously. He will back off. He will back down. Well, and, and, and we're going to do some, some training podcasts yes, on will. how to, not how to be that annoying. No, because <laughs> you already know how to do that. hopefully how to, because unfortunately the refs have to be worked. Yeah. How to be effective. We, that's what really, we have learned from the right. We have is, to learn to be effective. Right. Right. I'm going to read mm -hmm. Brent's letter. Brent writes us and says, after scratching my head for weeks trying to come up with something intelligent to add to the political discussion, I have come up with nothing relevant. I did, however, come up with something that is not relevant. And here it is. Yay. <laughs> when, when in Back to the Future, Marty got into the DeLorean to escape the Libyans, sure, he might have cruised back to the year 1955, but he'd find himself in empty space. Mm -hmm. Forget Earth's orbit. Our galaxy wasn't in the same place. True. There'd be nothing waiting for him there save a cold, dark vacuum. As he realized he was doomed, panic would set in and he'd try something desperate, probably involving plutonium, probably resulting in an explosion. I like the idea of Terminators floating through empty space, ready and waiting to kill. With Looper, they didn't have to send people back in time to get blasted. Just send them back in time, period. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Brent, <laughs> that, that's really good. And uh, Drift Glass, I know, would love to have a dorm room conversation with you about all of that. This is uh, <laughs> a, a question I have worked through, no kidding, in some of the stories, good ones and bad ones, I've written. Um, and various science fiction writers have dealt with this problem before. And uh, um, there's a, there are ways around it. But I appreciate the fact that Brent is thinking about this stuff yeah, to the point where it's, it's like, a, you know what? You know what? Now, Brent, let me blow your mind. What if... <laughs> What if the universe is not just moving at all times, everything in the, which it is, but we live in an expanding universe. So mm -hmm. everything in the future is much bigger physically than everything it is now. It's just all expanding in a uniform rate, so we don't notice it. What if you show up in the future and you're only an inch high? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's what or you, you go back in time. Mind. Or you go back in time and you're three hundred feet tall. I'm anyway. I I think that has also been talked about. In in Gull Gulliver's travels and so forth, that maybe he was time traveling. These are just a few of the reasons why I have not gotten many science fiction stories published because <laughs> these are bad <laughs> ideas, but they're ideas at least. <laughs> well, anyway, Brent closes off his letter by saying, I guess what I'm trying to say is I love listening to you guys and I hope Science Fiction University drops new episodes soon. So do we. <laughs> yeah. And that's on me, by the way, Brent. My job is to put together – um, notes and scripting, just light scripting so we can talk about stuff. And I have fallen mm -hmm. down on the job the last several months. I've been promising we'll get, to do it. I haven't done it. I feel bad about it. So if my guilt means anything to you, then <laughs> that one day it will build up to such a degree that I'll actually get off my ass and do the notes and then you'll have another episode. Because I really like doing that. I really oh, enjoy fun. doing Science it's Fiction fun. University. Yeah. It's, it's not politics. It's been a heavy, heavy, heavy year yeah. to yeah. do that. Um, anyway, I'm going to continue on with Bob's letter. Bob writes, right. I got to notice some bill on auto pay didn't go through. So I called Visa. A girl obviously reading a script asks if I was familiar with a donation to something called ProLeft Podcast. Then asked, were you pressured or under duress at the time to make these payments to ProLeft Podcast? <laughs> yes. Yes, in no, fact, you were. I hope not. Yeah. What? <laughs> no, they're nice people. They wouldn't do that. So they turned the card back on. I think that's t glorious. Oh, um, I'm so sorry that happened, that yeah. they turned off your credit. If anybody, if that happens to anybody else, please let us know. Oh, I Because we're going like, to report that to Visa and No, 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 whatever. no. We're going to sue somebody. We're going to sue the internet. We're going to sue uh, Twitter. <laughs> Isn't that what you do now? You, you get a little you pushback sue, from anybody. You, you just sue media. everybody. You know what? You know, you know what we've been? Bob, you've been canceled. Welcome to cancel culture, Bob. Cancel culture. That's what I hope, hope you like it. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to continue on. I have no PO connection other than as a customer like everyone, but always appreciate your shout outs. That's the post office. Last spring, probably around the time DeJoy was appointed, but before the story was big news, I mentioned to my mail carrier, we're on your side against the people trying to take your job away. 
It was obviously I hit a nerve. She proceeded to tell me that she and her husband, also a mail carrier, had been up at uh, 5 a.m. that day looking at their bank account, wondering what might happen. A couple weeks later, I printed out the Postal Union labels from your site and gave them to her along with a link, uh, the link information. You asked about voting experiences. We asked for mail ballots, but wouldn't have mailed them. They took too long. Uh, they took longer than they should have to arrive. So we voted early with a zero minute waiting time. Good for you. In and out. And really appreciate those people in long lines. As long as they're voting right, I mean left. Midsummer, we went to a tile store for kitchen tile. Somebody shouted from the back that they moved out years ago. This is going to be Biden headquarters in a week or so. So my wife has been volunteering at Casa Biden in the in West Tampa for the past couple of months. Good for her. Still Good for her. And we still haven't shopped for tile. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real story there, Bob. Yeah. Um, keep up the great work. Hope we're all feeling celebratory a week from now. From your lips, Bob. From your lips. Yeah, that's great. The, the tile people moved out years ago. This is going to be Biden headwards. Oh, can I volunteer? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Last letter. This is from Christina. Thank you for the pod. It is one of the highlights of my Friday night, Saturday morning. I'm from Missouri, and it's amazing to hear someone out there in the Midwest with liberal views. I moved to Missouri about four years ago, and the overwhelming redness of the state sometimes gets to me. We hear you, Christina. Boy, do we, yep. I've been doing postcards to voters because I'm too introverted for phone banking. Every time Blue Gal mentions her postcards, I'm right there with her. I'll be doing them again after the election. Because as Driftglass says, before the election, chop wood and carry water. After the election, chop wood and carry water. And yes, I actually... Uh, podcast listeners have been sending me stamps. I've got them all in a drawer with the postcards ready to go uh, for the Georgia runoff that might happen after next week. We're, we're ready for that. So uh, brace yourself. We're, I was feeling very sad this week when I had to stop writing postcards to voters. And then Drift Class reminded me, you know, there's lots of other people doing it and uh, you're all part of a team and isn't that great. And then I went, wait a minute, I'll probably be doing them again next week because of the Georgia runoff. So, <laughs> yay! <laughs> uh, Christina continues, I did have a question for you guys about the episode on the 16th, Burn the Republican Lifeboats, No GOP Rebranding. Is there any way for the average person to hold Republicans accountable for all they've done? It doesn't seem like just voting against them is enough, especially in such a red state as Missouri. I listen to a bunch of podcasts, and some of them are saying Trumpism and after Trump, and I want to shout at the casters that it's Republicans that are the problem, not just Trump, but I feel like I'd be yelling into a void. Thanks for all you do. I love you guys. Christina. Well, Christina, it's a big void, and we're in it with you. So Yeah, that's um, number one. Yeah. Number two is I think... You know, you, you, Christina, have given us our task yes. for the post-election podcast, which is we have to start talking about how do we make sure that that message gets out, that this isn't Trumpism, that you can't rebuild this party, there is no rebranding, they cash those checks with the Tea Party, et cetera. And it is going to take all of us, just like the postcards to voters, it's going to take all of us holding the media and politicians accountable for what they do. And we're not alone, just like with the postcards to voters. Many hands make light work, and we, if we all do it, we'll make it happen. Drift Class, let's do a news roundup. Let's do a news roundup, shall we? Would you like to sure. go first? Sure. Donald Trump decided the message of his campaign was too damn subtle. <laughs> <laughs> so to draw a big Sharpie circle around his major theme, he abandoned hundreds of his followers in Nebraska in the dark and freezing cold, with no way to get back home. He also abandoned his uh, rally goers in Florida to the heat right. and they were passing out. So, uh, and they're all getting COVID. Yeah. Cool. Uh, you might remember last week, Bibi Netanyahu began slowly backing away from Trump. This week, Vladimir Putin is slowly backing away from Trump. <sighs> Jerry Falwell Jr. is suing Liberty University for not helping him lie about his corruption and depravity. Yeah. What a real shame. Because $10 million to go away wasn't enough. Uh, last week, the U.S. reported roughly 60,000 new COVID-19 cases daily, which was up nearly 17% over the week before. 
This week, the United States reports another record high average. Uh, the number of coronavirus cases bringing the seven-day average up to around 71,000. Um, I heard it was higher than that. I heard it was closer to 90 on the radio today. It's just going up and up and up, which is an increase of more than 20% compared to last week and an increase of about 40% from two weeks ago, which is exactly how contagious diseases behave when you don't wear a fucking mask. The Supreme Court allowed extended deadlines for receiving mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. In the Pennsylvania case, the court left in place a lower court ruling allowing ballots to be counted until 5 p.m. on November 6th, as long as they are postmarked by Election Day. Now, the Department of Health and Human Services awarded a $250 million advertising contract to, quote, defeat, despair, and inspire hope amid the coronavirus pandemic weeks before the election. Now, the vetting process is the story. Trump's vetting process for hiring celebrities to appear in the ads is remarkably similar to the Bush vetting process for getting plum positions in the Iraqi provisional government. In this case, applicants were, were dropped if they had ever criticized Trump or supported Obama or supported gay rights or supported same-sex mar same marriage. Of the 274 celebrities under consideration, only 10 were approved, and half of those had to be Ted Nugent. And, and this whole thing just blew up. I mean... Yeah, there's just there's a lot going on in this story that uh, is just one more example of Donald Trump hiring incompetent people to do illegal things. To do terrible, terrible illegal things. Yeah. Yep. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, his wife and his son repeatedly emailed State Department officials about personal matters. Emails show that Susan Pompeo routinely gave instructions to State Department officials from her personal email address about travel plans, restaurant reservations, and maintenance requests for the house the Pompeos rent, including repairs to the HVAC system, the porch, and the stairs. Pompeo's son emailed State Department officials, these are people paid for with our taxes, mm -hmm. about including the software company he worked for in an upcoming data hackathon event. Now, for those of you out but there, but Hunter who, Biden, but by Hunter the way. Biden, but, but Hunter, Hunter Biden, of course, yes. but Hunter Biden, which is all people uh, on the right are hearing at all. It's just mm -hmm. Hunter Biden all the time, even though the story is now officially dead and buried. Um, for those of you still groaning under the weight of unpayable college loans, um, you should know that Donald Trump had more than two hundred and seventy million dollars in debt forgiven. Since 2010, after he defaulted on his loans for Chicago skyscraper development. And Drift Glass, do you know who one of the hedge fund managers he owed money to was? I do, but I'm not sure our listeners do. Steve Mnuchin. Oh, what does he do now? He is Secretary of the Treasury. Oh, that's right. He's in charge of the Has a trophy money. wife and is, you know, in, in charge of making sure Donald Trump's taxes stay secret. Yeah. Um. Former Homeland Security Chief of Staff Miles Taylor revealed that he was the anonymous author of a 2018 New York Times op-ed and a book that he sold that declared there was a resistance within the administration and nobody cares. The Senate confirmed Amy Coney or Amy Covid Barrett uh -huh. to the Supreme Court. Uh, we need to expand the court, folks. We do. We do. By, by any means necessary. White House Science Office ranked quote, ending the COVID-19 pandemic as the top of the list of Trump's first term accomplishments, despite infections spreading across the U.S. at the fastest rate since the start of the fucking pandemic. The Trump administration recently removed the chief scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Last month, the administration removed the agency's acting chief scientist, Craig McLean, replacing him with Ryan Maui, a former researcher for the Libertarian Cato Institute and a climate change denier. He he's just a climate change skeptic, Blue Gal. Ah, okay. I don't think he. Out, I, I wrote that, but I, th I think he's he's more in the middle. You know, he's, he's right down the center. That's where you want to uh -huh. go with something that Both might sides kill all life on Earth. Science, yeah. Uh, at least five of uh, Mike Pence's aides, including his chief of staff and senior political advisor, tested positive for something this week. I think it was COVID. But I thought Donald Trump ended the COVID-19 pandemic. He did. Uh, and I reminded someone on Twitter, probably Wet Moser, I'm not sure, um, or Dr. Vox, about turning the corner. Mm -hmm. is when, you're in a, when you're in a death spiral, 
all it is is a series of corners being turned downward and downward and yeah. downward and downward. Yeah. So well, yeah. it's the Friedman unit. You know, yeah. we're always turning the corner on. Yeah, yeah. Six more months, blue gal. Six more months. <laughs> In local news, new coronavirus restrictions go into effect today where we live. Mm-hmm. Please shop local as best you can. We have some amazing businesses here in Springfield that have been real troopers and friends of the community who are right on the edge of collapse because some assholes refuse to follow basic public health guidelines and have screwed us all. Yeah. And we'd like to give a big shout out to local trivia wizard, Russ Friedwald, who has been running a an awesome online trivia game for a couple of days a week. Since the pandemic hit, he does it for free, basically for Patreon donations. It's going to be reorganized uh, shortly into something different, but it's yeah. I think he's getting ready to do to get back to the business that he had, which is doing charity trivia. uh, But he's moved it online because of COVID. Yeah, and uh, we were kind of his guinea pigs, I think, for the seven months that he's been doing it. And now everybody wants to get back to fundraising because they have to. Yep. but he it it's been so much fun to play trivia uh, online with Russ, and we so appreciate all the work you put into it. You really do. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Charlie. Charlie is 20 years old, and he's struggling with a few medical issues. So Charlie's owner wanted to get his photo out there before Charlie heads out <laughs> over the Rainbow Bridge. Listen, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we never talk about Rainbow Bridges. No. Some some of our internet kitties have passed over the Rainbow Bridge and some have not. Mm-hmm. And uh, we don't ever worry about which side of the Rainbow no. Bridge the kitty is on. We love them all. There's only one kitty in the whole world and it just happens to have different aspects, millions of different aspects. Right. And we love them all. <laughs> um, but Charlie is 20 years old. He was rescued in Memphis and has lived in Boston, Anna Anaheim, San Jose, Austin, and Raleigh Jesus. before finally settling in Boulder. So he's, he's a, moved around. He's a he's a Johnny Cash song, for God's he sake. He is. Yeah. He's a Johnny Cash song. <laughs> he loves to catch mice and show them around the house. <laughs> he loves to lounge on warm surfaces like heating blankets, and he loves to sit on humans also. Yep. Mm-hmm. Now that he is older, he loves to sleep. Mm-hmm. Charlie was never an outside kitty. That is safer for him and safer for the urban wildlife in our neighborhood. Yeah, I bet it is. He's a hunter, it sounds like. Uh, Charlie does enjoy the show that the neighborhood raccoons put on outside in the evenings. These days, his cat food is a broth. He cannot handle chunks. Mm -hmm. But every time, it's freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Mm -hmm. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store drek, or broth for a senior kitty. And we have done that before. <laughs> we have sure we have. not, Drift we Class? Absolutely yep. Have. Yep. Senior kitties sometimes have to have broth. That's just fine. Your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Charlie at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We do love hearing from you. Believe me, we love your letters. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. We know a lot of our listeners have been using their spare cash to support Democrats, and particularly your local Democratic candidate. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really been an important thing to do. Uh, Now that the election is just about over, if you have that cash uh, available, $5 a month as a PayPal or Patreon donation. We really appreciate it. That pays our bills. Thank you. Or honestly, um, if you are named like Pete Omidyar (laughs) and you're feeling like guilty about bankrolling a lunatic with a quarter of a billion dollars, uh, we'll take a tenth of that in cash, really. We will will absolve you of all of your guilt, uh, throw a little cash over the transom, and we'll call it Drift class will be very happy to take Pete Omidyar's uh, Sure. 
any any mount from Pete Omidyar. What, whatever or... he's got, really. It's fine. I'm cool with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Please share our show on social media. And thank you so much for doing that. Happy birthday, Drift Glass. Thank you, Blue Gal. How are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties are not going to let COVID or Donald Trump ruin Halloween, which is objectively the coolest holiday of them all. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying and the shooting and the dying and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020. DGBG Productions.